All right. Where's everyone at tonight? Or everyone sitting on this side, not on this side. We're glad you're here. We did some uh, picking of songs earlier. I sent out a text and some people did some favorites. We're going to start tonight with Alfredo's How Can I Keep From Singing Your Praise. Look to the screen for it. And then we got some other. We got some ones we haven't sang in a while tonight. Some good hymns. Some, some good choices tonight. They're always good, but we'll sing it together on this first verse. <clears throat> there is an endless song that goes in my soul. I hear the music ring. And though the storms may come, I am holding on to the rock I cling. How can I keep from singing your praise? How can I ever say enough? How amazing is your love? How can I keep from shouting your name? I know I am loved by the King, and it makes my heart want to sing. I will lift my eyes in the darkest night, for I know my Savior lives, and I will walk with through and sing the songs you give how can i keep from singing your praise how can i ever say enough how amazing is your love how can I keep from shouting your name? I know I am loved by the King. Let's do that chorus one more time. Want to sing. How can I keep from singing your praise? How can I ever say enough? How amazing is your love? How can I keep from shouting your name? I know I am loved by the King, and it makes my heart want to sing. I love that part. I know I am loved by the King. Great song, good singing. 529, if you want your song book, How Firm a Foundation. Ryan picked this song. Good song here. I love the words to this hymn here. <clears throat> we'll sing it together tonight. <clears throat> How firm a foundation ye saints of the lord is laid for your faith in his excellent word what more can he say than to you he has said to you who for refuge to Jesus have fled. Fear not, I am with thee. Oh, be not dismayed, for I am thy God and will still give thee aid. I'll strengthen thee, help thee, and cause thee to stand upheld by my right, just on it, but in hand. On that last verse, went through 
Trials thy pathway shall lie, my grace all sufficient shall be thy supply. The flame shall not hurt thee, I only design thy dross to consume and thy gold to refine. Good thing we'll sing a few more in a few minutes. Let's go, Lord, in prayer and start our service off. Father, we're grateful for another evening to be gathered in your house together. Thank you for this morning. Thank you for how you work and what you've done. We need you. I pray that tonight as we gather here, that all that's said and done in this place will bring you honor and bring you glory. Thank you for being the God that you are. Bless all that's said, and we need you tonight. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. All right, a couple of announcements we'll run through. Awana's this Thursday. It's pizza night, pizza party night, so that'll be fun for the kids and that. And uh, also we're in need of toys for the store on December 19th. And uh, dollar store toys, right, is what you said this morning. And so we need toys. That'll be a good thing. So if you can get some or if you want to turn in money and do it that way, that works as well. I think someone turned in some money today, which is a good thing. And so either way, it works. And so if you're able to help with that, that would be great. And uh, our WANA program is going good. I think between 30 and 35 kids, which that's a good weekly amount of kids that are here. And then they um, are in the Word of God, memorizing verses. And uh, it's a great thing. One of the things I loved about I never did in the WANA program growing up. And uh, one of the things that a pastor friend of mine who was talking about how they do it, and uh, I wondered what he liked so much about it. He said, they get started young and they go through it, they just learn so much Bible. And there's nothing better in the world for our children to learn than the Word of God. Because thy word have I hid in my heart, that I might not sin against thee. And so I think it's wonderful that all these kids can come and learn the Bible and memorize verses and be a part of the program. And so if you're able to help with those things, that would be great. Also, teens, this Friday we have an activity going to Lancaster for a college basketball game. We're leaving here at 4, be back around 10. And then um, if you didn't give money this morning, if you signed up for a turkey and you want to give money towards <coughs> turkeys, if you want to turn that in the, in the offering in a couple of minutes, that would be great. Just mark turkeys on there, and that would be good. And if you're bringing groceries, make sure you bring them Wednesday through Friday this week. That would be a blessing. And uh, and the other thing, Friday would be probably be best overall, but then people will, um, frozen pies, I know sometimes frozen pies stay a little bit better, but we really have very, very limited freezer space. And so maybe one of these days we'll just get, some, we'll get a big freezer down there so we just throw all the turkeys in there early and all of that. But um, it's not that way right now. So the best would be a fresh pie, but make sure it's dated well and all of that good stuff. And that'll be good. If you could help with the service, 1230 here on Saturday, and we need people to just help be here, be friendly, greet people, and uh, also pass out the groceries, all that good stuff. So if you'll be here around 1230, we'll be done by 2 o'clock on Saturday. And I mentioned this morning, we have double the people signed up to come than what we had last year right at the time of the event, and so that'll be good. And so the more people that come, the better to hear the gospel. And uh, either way, <clears throat> if we do... We won't have more than 60 family units. If we did that, then they could either get a bag of groceries or a turkey. There's 30 family units they could get both, and we'll see how it happens when they come. And so that'll be good. And then next Sunday night, we'll have our church's um, Thanksgiving dinner together and uh, smoked turkey, and that's always a good thing. And uh, ham that has a uh, honey glaze on it. It's not honey-baked ham. The ties haven't been that good this year to go to Honey Bake to get one of those. Those are overly priced, and you can get just as good at Sam's Club just about for a lot less money. And so, but I'm glad in my family, I got a brother that's got all the big bucks. He makes all the, so he brings the honey baked ham to Thanksgiving and to Christmas. So that's always a blessing in our house. And so that'll be next Sunday night at five. Dinner will be in here. What will happen is the setup of all the food and everything will be outside, but you'll be able to eat in here. And that'll be good. Then afterwards, we'll just have service right in here with the tables up and everything. Just do it that way. And then with that evening, we'll, after we're done with that, um, next Sunday night, we'll take down and set the auditorium back up. We're going to leave the side rooms of tables for our 
praise and pie night on Wednesday night that we always have. And so Wednesday night right before Thanksgiving, we normally don't give much of a message. It's more of a time of praises and just a time to thank God for his goodness. What I'm going to do this year, and it's a little different than what I normally do, it's the last Wednesday night of my series on the prophecy, uh, biblical view of prophecy. And the last message is all about heaven. So I think talking about heaven and the joy of heaven and all the wonders of heaven will fit great in with Thanksgiving and we'll tie the two together. I normally don't do that, but it's this year, if you look at the calendar, the way it's set up, after that, we're already into December right after that. And so that's what we'll do for that. And also one other announcement, I should have made this this morning, but I didn't. <clears throat> During the month of December, we're going to keep going in the book of Ephesians on Sunday mornings. I'm not going off of that. So I know it's Christmas, and a lot of people, what about a Christmas message and all that? Sunday morning and Sunday night are staying normal through the month of December. Wednesday night will be a special Christmas series starting the first Wednesday night of December and carry on through the month, and we'll see some things. The Sunday right before Christmas, the 22nd, we'll take a break from everything, and I'll have a Christmas message in the morning and evening as well, just that day. So in case if that matters to any of you, let's sing a couple more songs tonight. The next song that was given to me, I think, was it Isaiah in the garden? Or was it your mom? It was you or your mom. And so in the garden, that's a great song. We'll sing it together. If you want it in the songbook, it's 271. <clears throat> I come to the garden alone while the dew And the voice I hear falling on my ear, the Son of God discloses, and He walks with me, and He talks with me. And he tells me I am his own, and the joy we share as we tarry there, none other known on that second verse. He speaks, and the sound of his voice is so sweet, the birds hush their singing, and the melody that he gave to me within my heart is ringing and he walks with me and he talks with me and he tells me I am his own and the joy we share as we tarry there, none other. We'll sing it together on that last verse. I'd stay in a garden with him, though the night around me be falling. But he bids me go through the voice of woe. His voice to me is calling. And he walks, talks with me. And he tells me I am his own, and the joy we share as we tarry there, none other.
right, we got two more from the favorites that were sent to me. 56, the old rugged cross. And Andrew sent me that one. The old rugged cross. Great song. We'll sing it together. <clears throat> On a hill far away stood an old rugged cross, the emblem of suffering and shame and I love that old cross where the dearest and best for a world of lost sinners was slain so I'll cherish the old rugged cross till my trophies at last I lay down, and I will cling to the old rugged cross, and exchange it someday for a crown. In that old rugged cross, Stained with blood so divine, a wondrous beauty I see. For it was on that old cross, Jesus suffered and died to pardon and sanctify me. Perish the old rugged cross till my trophies at last I lay down. <laughs> rugged cross and exchange it someday for a crown on that last verse to the old rugged cross i will ever be true its shame and reproach gladly bear and then he'll call me someday to my home far away, where is glory forever I'll share. Sing together. So I'll cherish the old cross till my trophies at last I lay. I will cling to the old rugged cross and exchange it someday for a crown. Last song, Louis picked it. Come thou fount, come thou king, so it's the combination of that old classic along with that new chorus with it and a second verse. So we'll sing it together. Here we go. Basically the same tune. Come thou fount of every blessing, tune my heart to sing thy grace. Streams of mercy never ceasing, call for songs of loudest praise. Teach me some melodious sonnet Sung by flaming tongues above Praise the mount time Mount of thy redeeming I was lost in Till you came and rescued me I was bound by all my sin when your love came and set me free. 
Now my soul can sing a new song. Now my heart has found a home. Now your grace is always with me, and I'll never be alone. Come thou found once or twice. Come thou precious Prince of Peace. Hear your bride to you we sing. Come thou fount of our blessing. Come thou fount, come thou king. Come thou precious Prince of Peace. Hear your bride to you we sing. Come thou fount of our blessing. On that last verse, O oh, to grace, how great a debtor, daily I'm constrained to be. Let thy goodness bind my wandering heart to thee. Prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. Here's my heart, Lord, take and seal it. Seal it for thy courts above. Come thou found, come thou king. Come thou precious prince of peace. Hear your bride to you we sing. Come thou found. Let's do it one more time. Sing. Come thou found. Come thou king. Come thou precious prince of peace. Hear your bride to you we sing. Come thou found of our blessing. Amen. Good singing tonight. Good choices by those who pick the songs. One of our ushers come for offering tonight. Marquise, you can help out with the offering tonight and help John with that. And uh, thank you for being faithful in your tithes and offerings. And if you're going to give something towards those turkeys, make sure you mark that there. And that'll be a blessing. And why don't you go ahead, Marquise, and pray tonight for the offering. The way the video works is it covers first and second kings together. So we're going to play it next week, and I'm going to dive right into the message tonight is what I'm going to do. We're at 627. If you're here in the second service today, I think we got out at about 1230 today, and it went a little long. The sermon was a little over an hour. And uh, first service, the sermon was a little long. It didn't seem long to me. Hopefully it didn't seem too long to all of you, but I don't try to make a habit of those things, but... The truth that was there, it's one of those things you need to finish it all up together. And I thought the second service would move quicker than the first one, and it didn't. So I'm going to do my best not to do the same thing to you tonight and have you here till 8 o'clock. We're going to get right to it. Anyone need a copy of the notes? If you didn't get a copy of the notes, you need a set. Alyssa right there, and that's about it. All right, we'll dive into things tonight and see where we get to. Take your Bibles with me. 
I want you to go with me to 1 Kings chapter number 2. 1 Kings chapter number 2, and we'll dive right in tonight and uh, see where we get to and get through 1 Kings. And next week, we'll look at 2 Kings. If I get through the message and there's a little bit of time left by the end, I will. we can play the video then. We'll see where we're at on time tonight. And so we'll go ahead tonight. You're in 1 Kings chapter number 2. And look down at verse number 1. The Bible says, Now the days of David drew nigh that he should die. And he charged Solomon his son, saying, I go the way of all the earth. Be thou strong, therefore, and show thyself a man. And keep the charge of the Lord thy God to walk in his ways, to keep his statutes and his commandments and his judgments and his testimonies, as it is written in the law of Moses, that thou mayest prosper in all that thou doest, and whithersoever thou turnest thyself. Now, something that I'll just give you a little thought here as we dive through here tonight. You know, this world has many ideas of what a real man is. David explains here what a real man is. A real man, in verse number three, um, keeps the charge of the Lord his God. He walks in the ways of God. He keeps his statutes and his commandments. That's what a real man does. I know in our world we have manliness and macho-ness and all those things. In Montana, you weren't real, remember this morning? You're not a real man unless you own a gun. But you can be a real man and not own a gun. I got two I carry all the time with me. And uh, got a few laughs with that. But that was, I don't know if you should be laughing or not. Look at what David said to his son Solomon in verse number four. That the Lord may continue his word which he spake concerning me, saying, if thy children take heed to their way, to walk before me in truth with all their heart and with all their soul, there shall not fail thee, saith he, a man on the throne of Israel. Moreover, thou knowest also that Joab, and he goes into all these different things he wants them to take care of, but we see here that David is on his deathbed here. David's life has been lived. We've talked about in the first, uh, as we went through First and Second Samuel, we've seen the first two kings of Israel. We've seen Saul. We've seen David. And David, there was a lot of good things in David's life. There's also a lot of bad in David's life. But David was a man after God's own heart. And then we see tonight his son Solomon reigning in his stead. If I were to give a title to First Kings, it would be this. Wisdom turns to foolishness. And influence turns to relevance. Irrelevant. It's supposed to be irrelevance. And Jay didn't quite get that on there, or I gave it to him wrong. It could be either way. But what you understand tonight, Solomon had so much going for him. You go to chapter number three of First Kings here. And we're looking at a little bit of Bible here as we dive in. But look at verse number five. It says in chapter number three. And Gibeon, the Lord, appeared to Solomon in a dream by night. And God said, Ask what I shall give thee. And Solomon said, Thou hast shown thy servant David, my father, great mercy, according as he walked before thee in truth and in righteousness and in uprightness of heart with thee. And thou hast kept for him this great kindness that thou hast given him a son to sit on his throne as it is this day. And now, O Lord my God, thou hast made my servant king instead of David my father. But I am but a little child. I know not how to go out and, or come in. And thy servant is in the midst of thy people, which thou hast chosen a great people that cannot be numbered nor counted for a multitude. Give therefore thy servant an understanding heart to judge thy people, that I may discern between good and bad for who is able to judge this thy so great a people. And the speech pleased the Lord that Solomon had asked. And God said unto him, Because thou hast asked this thing, and hast not asked for thyself long life, neither hast asked for riches for thyself, nor hast asked the life of thine enemies, but hast asked for thyself understanding to discern judgment. Behold, I have done according to thy words. And lo, I'll give thee a wise and understanding heart, so that there was none like thee before thee, neither after thee shall any arise like unto thee. And I also give thee that which thou hast not asked, both riches and honor, so that there shall be, so there shall be any among the kings like unto thee all thy days. And if thou wilt walk in my ways, to keep my statutes and my commandments, as thy father David did, 
then will I lengthen thy days. And we see, and as we get into 1 Kings, you, you understand and know that Solomon is one of the wisest men that have lived. And other than Jesus Christ, I would say he's the wisest that's ever lived, the Bible says. And God took a man and raised him up. And there were a lot of great things that took place under the reign of Solomon. I want to talk about that tonight. I want to talk about what took place towards the end of his reign. And we'll go through all these different things. Let's dive in tonight and get into the notes. We see in the book of First and Second Kings, the nation of Israel makes major changes. The nation that Joshua led from the wilderness into the promised land in order to be a witness to the nation ends up doing the same mistakes that all those nations they were supposed to drive out of Israel did. When we look here, once again, First and Second Samuel, they were one book. First and Second Kings, they were originally one book, covered about 400 years of history, of, the, of Israel's history. They open up with Solomon taking the throne of David, and it, the book of, of Second Kings ends with the destruction of Jerusalem. In 400 years, quite a bit transpires. At the beginning of First Kings, they're building a temple. At the end of Second Kings, that temple is being burnt down by Nebuchadnezzar. It starts out with a stable, unified Israel that's blessed under the leadership of David and then his son Solomon, and it ends with the fall of Jerusalem and the deportation of many Jews to captivity in Babylon. It begins with the death of David, and it closes with the death of a king, first kings here, a man by the name of Ahab. And there's a big difference between David and Ahab. The first 11 chapters talk about the 40 wonderful years of Solomon's reign over Israel. The second 11 chapters cover the first 80 years of a divided kingdom. We see that Israel and Judah split. We'll talk in a few minutes why this happened. Northern Israel and southern Judah. And why did they split? What happened? How did this all happen? We'll look through the book and go from 1 Kings tonight, just through 1 Kings, and try and tie all those things together and see how could a people go from being united in a great kingdom to Babylon coming in and wiping them out. That's what we're going to look at tonight. We look at number one, if you're following along in the outline there, we'll look at number one, we see the seeds of decline. First thing that we see is Solomon's reign. Solomon's reign. The book starts with David's death and Solomon's anointed to be the next king. Chapter 2, as we read a few minutes ago, a lot of the things that you see David talk to Solomon about sounds a lot like what Moses said to Joshua back in the book of uh, Deuteronomy. David dies and Solomon begins to reign and the Lord blesses him. Solomon's prayer, as we read a minute ago, for wisdom and understanding in chapter number 3, and everything was going so well. Chapters 5 and 6, Solomon builds the temple that David dreamed of and prepared for. Solomon's temple's built, and it's the first temple Israel's ever had. He builds his own palace in chapter number 7, and in chapter 8, God's glory fills the temple, and Solomon dedicates the temple to God. Now go with me to chapter number 9. Great victory is taking place. And yet we see God come in once again to Solomon with a warning here. Chapter number 9, and look at verse number 1. It says, And it came to pass when Solomon had finished the building of the house of the Lord and the king's house, and all Solomon's desires which he had pleased to do, that the Lord appeared to Solomon the second time, as he appeared unto him at Gibeah. First time he appeared, remember the Lord asked him, what shall I give you? All that. So look at verse number two. It says, or verse number three, and the Lord said unto him, I have heard thy prayer and thy supplication that thou hast made before me. I have hallowed this house which thou hast built to put my name there forever. And mine eyes and my heart shall be there perpetually. Now look at God's conditions here. And if thou wilt walk before me as David thy father walked, in integrity of heart, and in the brightness, and to do according to all that I have commanded thee, 
and will keep my statutes and my judgments. Now, just think with me for a minute. That's awful nice talk about David, isn't it? We see the scripture and what the Bible tells us, all of David's flaws. Do you see what the Bible says right here? That's how God is when we confess our sins. He's faithful and just to forgive us. He does not view us the way we view ourselves. He views us in light of his son. And so did, was David perfect in all these things? <laughs> no, but that's how he was the great picture of God's grace and God's mercy. There's a lot of other things God could have said about David right here, but he doesn't. And look at verse number five. The Bible says here, Then I will establish the throne of thy kingdom upon Israel forever, as I have promised to David thy father, saying, There shall not fail thee a man upon the throne of Israel. But, look at verse six, If ye shall, be, shall at all turn from following me, Ye or your children. Now, remember, everything's going well. The kingdom's prospering. The temple's been built. Solomon's house's been built. Solomon, the Israel's doing great at this time. And God comes in with a warning. Look at verse 6. But if ye shall at all turn from following me, ye or your children, and will not keep my commandments and my statutes which I have set before you, but go and serve other gods and worship them, then will I cut off Israel out of the land which I have given them, and this house which I have hallowed for my name will I cast out of my sight. And Israel shall be a proverb and a byword among all people. And at this house which is high, every one that passeth by it shall be astonished and shall hiss. And they shall say, Why hath the Lord done thus unto this land and to this house? And then shall answer, Because they forsook the Lord their God, who brought them forth out of their father and their fathers out of the land of Egypt, and have taken hold upon other gods and have worshipped them and served them. Therefore hath the Lord brought upon them all this evil. God gives them and gives Solomon a warning. Hey Solomon, you do things my way. You follow me. There's going to be great blessings that happen. You know, a lot of times we want to look at the Bible and we look at things that God says, the promises of God. But you see how God told Solomon here, there were great promises. But God told Solomon, now this is what you have to do. You don't keep your end of the bargain. You don't get the blessing. Now, when we look at this, one of the things I want to remind you is this, that after seasons of great victory, which Solomon was having in his life, we are very vulnerable for failure. After seasons of great faith, we're vulnerable for great doubt. At the end of the message tonight, we're going to look at Elijah for a few minutes. After seasons of great humility, we're vulnerable for great pride to creep in. Chapter number 10, we see that the Queen of Sheba comes. And she comes and the half, she, it was even greater than what she imagined it was. Everything is going great in Israel and Solomon. And then we get to chapter number 11. Go to chapter number 11. And look at verse number one. The Bible says, But King Solomon loved many strange women, together with the daughter of Pharaoh, women of the Moabites, the Ammonites, the Edomites, the Zidonites, and the Hittites, of the nations concerning which the Lord said unto the children of Israel, Ye shall not go into them, neither shall they come unto you, for surely they will turn away your heart after their God. Solomon clave unto these in love. And he had 700 wives princesses, and 300 concubines, and his wives turned away his heart. Verse 4, And it came to pass when Solomon was old that his wives turned away his heart after other gods, and his heart was not perfect with the Lord his God, as was the heart of David his father. And you can see that Solomon went after Ashtoreth, the goddess of the Zidonians. All the things that God was trying to keep his people away from Solomon started doing. You see the seeds of decline here. We see the destruction, the fullness of a wise man. Probably got thinking he was wiser than God. That would be my take. Solomon was a very wise man. 
but God made it very clear every king in Israel, there's a portion of the law that they're supposed to read. For sake of time, you could read Deuteronomy chapter 17. And God made it very clear about the kings of Israel. that The kings, when they were kings, they were not supposed to marry many women because their heart could be turned away from God. He also warned them about um, the wealth that they had, the horse, all those different things. God had a whole set of plans. He commanded against doing certain things. And we see that Solomon did opposite of what God thought. Make sure you understand something. You can be some of the wisest people in the world, and you can be turned into a fool in a matter of minutes. Don't ever get thinking too highly of yourself and of your opinion and what you think. This book should always trump everything we think. Because God knows everything. His way is greater than our ways. His law is what we need. And Christians today, we have a lot of Christians that are near, not, not near as wise as Solomon. But they act like they can mess with sin. They can do all the things they want to with their lives. And nothing's going to happen. Don't mess around with things God says not to. Solomon, what a tragic fall takes place. And we see, number one, the, um, the seeds of decline during Solomon's reign. It starts out so well and comes to an end so tragically. Number two, we see the advance of the decline. We see the kingdom's division. Chapter 12 through chapter 14, Israel is divided into two. And it's because of Solomon's son, Rehoboam. But let me just tell you something. It all started because of Solomon and what he did. I want you to look with me at chapter number 12 and go down with me to verse number 16. So when all Israel saw that the king hearkened not to them, the people answered the king saying, What portion have we in David? Neither have we inheritance in the son of Jesse. To your tents, O Israel, now see to thine own house, David. So Israel departed unto their tents. But as for the children of Israel which dwelt in the cities of Judah, Rehoboam reigned. And Rehoboam sent Adoram, who was over the tribute. And all Israel stoned him with stones, and he died. Therefore King Rehoboam made speed to get him up to his chariot to flee to Jerusalem. So Israel rebelled against the house of David unto this day. Solomon's son comes into power. He's the new king. And he asks some of the older people, how should I rule? He also asks some of his peers how he should rule. One thing you got to remember, there is wisdom in mature aged people. They've been around the block a few times that others might not. I think it's a very important thing. One of the things that I try and do in my life as a pastor, I, if I need help in an area as a pastor, I don't go to pastors that are my same age because they're probably going to know about as much as I do. And there are some that might be way better. I try to find older men who are more seasoned. You're having problems with a marriage. You know, you say, well, pastor, you've been married less than me. Why should I come to you? Well, I'm going to give you plenty of Bible principles, and I think you should. That's why God gives you a pastor to help you. It's one of the reasons why he does. But I'll also say this. There are many who have been married a long time. You probably get some good advice from them. If they still sit next to each other and they like each other, they've been married almost 50 years, that's something to, that's, that's pretty special right there. But Rehoboam basically says that his pinky finger is thicker than his dad's waist. And, waist. and if you thought I was, if he was a hard leader, you haven't seen anything yet. And Israel wasn't going to be a part of that. So the kingdom gets divided. Jeroboam, who had been promoted in Solomon's kingdom, is asked to be king over the ten tribes. So Israel splits. Now I'm supposed to put a picture up on the screen for you, and I was going to work on that, but Marquise totally threw off the computer back there tonight. I still don't know what he did, and I think we're okay, but I didn't get to get my picture on there, so I'm blaming Marquise that's not back there because... I come in and he's back there. He's like, I don't know what I did. That's always a problem when someone says, I don't know what I did. And so new church law that's going to go in the Constitution, Marquise cannot touch the church computer. Marquise or Russ, either one of them, we'll keep both of them off of it. 
seen Russ with technology too. I was just waking you up, Russ. You were sleeping over there, so it's okay. So I want to get you back with us. I want to get you back with us for a minute. So, or maybe you're already gone. Never mind. But Israel splits. The ten tribes go with Jeroboam as the north, and that's what Israel was. Two tribes stay with Rehoboam in the south. That's Judah. So Israel now is split into two. You have Israel, the ten northern kingdoms, and you have Judah, two southern king the tribes there together. Um, he keeps Israel and those things. The northern king of Jeroboam, Samaria is the capital. And Jerusalem is the capital for Judah. And so Israel ends up divided for almost 400 years. But we see a long line of kings on both sides of things. And I'm working on, it's not going to be anytime soon. I, I'm always working on sermons. But I've been working on going through all the kings of Israel and the kings of Judah. And you could see, start, starting with Solomon going, I mean, with Saul going all the way along. And then when you get to where the kingdom splits after Solomon, Jeroboam and Rehoboam. And you see, you really can't say there were good kings on Jeroboam's side of things. And Jeroboam had a lot of problems in his life. I don't think you'd find one. There are several good kings on Rehoboam's side. And I believe that that's because of David is why. And Josiah. Hezekiah was a pretty good king. We go through and the list goes back and forth. But I'm working on a sermon series to go through all the kings and to talk about them. Someday we might get there. I might be about 100 years old by the time it's done. Who knows? Um, but we see the kingdom splits. Israel, though, gets taken captive by Assyria a long time before Judah's taken captive by Babylon. And so we see the division that's there. Both nations worshipped idols. The northern kingdom built two golden calves. And we see their stubbornness, their self-centeredness. It's just astounding at times when you look at it. But then I think about myself. I have a little bit of compassion there. See number three tonight, we see the fruit of the decline. We see Israel's plumb in chapter 15 and 16. These two chapters cover several decades and describe the northern kingdom's plummet. Jeroboam's son, Nadab. And then we see how he's assassinated and his son and Zimri kills him and becomes king. Zimri commits suicide and Omri becomes king. And you see all these things happen and all of this happened because Solomon planted the seed of wickedness a short time before that. We see number four, and lastly tonight for 1 Kings, we see the ends of decline. And the end of the chapter, the end of the book of 1 Kings deals with Elijah and Ahab. The last six chapters tell the story of King Ahab, king of Israel, and it talks about the prophet Elijah. From here on out, the rest of the chapter, what ends up happening is this. What we see with Israel was God has prophets or preachers who would call out idolatry and injustice, reminding Israel to repent and to obey and to keep each king accountable. That's what the prophets were there for. Elijah was one of them. And we see that Israel was given kings who reflected their own character. Israel was hard-hearted towards God and His Word, so God gave them a king that was hard-hearted towards God and His Word. And God would speak through prophets, not kings. Remember, God sent Nathan to David. Well, Elijah would confront Ahab. And the study of Elijah, you want to do a study for yourself and something that will be a blessing in your Christian life and be good for you, take Elijah and study him. A while back, I did a study for the teenagers. days, we went through the life of Elijah. And we see so many, a great man of God. And we see so many great things happen. Remember, he goes and says there's going to be a famine. And then God tells him to go by this river. And the famine comes, and the river dries up. And then God sends him to a widow to take care of him. And then when he gets to the widow, she says, I've got just enough meal here for my son and I to die with. This is our last meal. And God does great things. 
And God works in great ways. We see shortly after that time that Elijah stands up against 450 prophets of Baal. And the prophets of Baal are out there trying to cut themselves and trying to get their God to work. And I love the trash talking that Elijah's doing. Oh, sorry, your God must be asleep. He can't, or maybe he can't hear you. I don't know what your problem is. And then we see Elijah, he has them bring a bunch of water and put it all over the sacrifice. And I'll tell you something. I know I'm not an outdoorsman and I'm not a Montanan, but I do know this. You don't pour water all over the wood you want to start a fire with. That's not the smart thing to do. I like to pour gasoline on it because, and then your fire starts right up. That's me. It works great at time. You never have an issue. Who needs to buy those little fire starters? They, aren't, they don't work very good, and they're very expensive. A little gasoline goes a long ways to help a fire get started that you're trying to have. If I ever start one in the little pit that we have, a little gasoline gets it going just fine. Kids, don't listen to what I just said. Don't ever play with gasoline. Just remember that tonight. But when we think of, and so they pour water and the fire falls from heaven, takes everything, and wow, what a victory takes place. And this is something I want to give you tonight to try to be an encouragement to you and help you as we round the finish line at 654. Go with me to chapter number 18, 1 Kings chapter 18. And then when you get there, flip to chapter 19. One more chapter. One more chapter. And so the scripture says, chapter 19, verse number 1, And Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done, and with all how he had slain all the prophets with the sword. Then Jezebel sent, as you see, Ahab couldn't even take care of it himself. He had to go tell his wife all that the prophet was doing. And Jezebel took care of everything. Have you ever heard anybody name their daughter Jezebel? I don't think I've ever heard of that. There's a reason, and she's right here in the scriptures before us. And Jezebel sent a messenger unto Elijah, saying, So let the gods do to me, and more also, if I make not thy life as the life of one of them by tomorrow about this time. And when he saw that, he arose and went for his life, and came to Beersheba, which belonged to Judah, and left his servant there. And he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a juniper tree. And he requested for himself that he might die and said, Is enough now, O Lord. Take away my life, for I am not better than my father's. The man of God, the man who got all that meal for the widow, the man who called fire down from heaven says, God, just end my life. One of the things that we see is with Elijah, we see a man who dealt with depression in his life. You see it very right before your eyes. And it's real stuff. It's not something that we should joke around about or mock. It's real and it happens. Now, I am not an expert on depression. I'm not an expert on anxiety and in those areas of life. But I want to give you, I want you to see just a couple quick things that God does, first of all. We see verse number five, and as he lay and slept under a juniper tree, behold, an angel touched him and said to him, Arise and eat. And he looked, and behold, there was a cake baked of the coals and a cruise of water at his head, and he did eat and drink and laid him down again. One of the things, if you're going through a hard struggle, maybe depression, whatever the case may be, just going through a real hard time in the Christian life, one of the things that you read about right there in that passage is the fact that sleep is important. He was on the run from Jezebel. You don't see the Lord coming to him and trying to straighten him out right away. The first thing the Lord lets him do, he lets him sleep. And then what does he do? He wakes him up and has him eat. And then he has him go back to sleep. The Lord gives his beloved sleep. A lot of times when we're going through a hard time in our life, we stay awake a lot and we don't sleep. 
one of the things I want to encourage you with is sleep. And then we get off on the things that we do. We see this is how the Lord did it. He slept. He ate. Then he slept again. Now keep on reading. In verse number 8, And the angel of the Lord came to him again the second time and touched him and said, Arise and eat, because the journey is too great for thee. And he arose and did eat and drink and went in the strength of that meat forty days and forty nights in the whore of the mount of God. And he came thither unto a cave and lodged there. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him, and he said unto him, What doest thou here, Elijah? And he said, I have been very jealous for the Lord God of hosts. For the children of Israel have forsaken thy covenant, thrown down thine altars, and slain thy prophets which, with the sword. And I, even I only, am left that they should seek my life to take it away. And he said, Go forth and stand upon the mountain before the Lord. And behold, the Lord passed by, and a great and strong wind rent the mountain and break in pieces the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord wasn't in the wind. And afterward, an earthquake, but the Lord wasn't in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire, but the Lord wasn't in the fire. And after the fire, a still small voice. And it was so when Elijah heard it that he wrapped his face in his mantle and went out and stood in the entering in of the cave. And behold, there came a voice unto him which said, What doest thou here, Elijah? And he said, I have been very jealous for the Lord God of hosts, because the children of Israel have forsaken thine covenant, throw down thine altars, and slain thy prophets with the sword. And I, even I only, am left, and they seek my life to take it away. Look at what God tells him. The Lord said unto him, Go, return on thy way to the wilderness of Damascus. And when thou comest, anoint Hazael to be king over Syria. And Jehu, the son of Nimshai, shalt thou anoint to be king over Israel. And Elisha, the son of Shaphath of Abel, Mahola, shalt thou anoint to be prophet in thy room. And it came to pass that he that escapeth the sword of Hazael shall, slay, shall Jehu slay, and him that escapeth from the sword of Jehu shall Elijah slay. Yet I have left me 7,000 in Israel, all the knees which have not bowed unto Baal, and every mouth which hath not kissed him. So he departed thence and found Elisha, and God did several things for Elijah that I want to give you as we close tonight. Some things I want you to remember. Some application. Number one, people of great faith can also be people of great doubt. People of great faith can also be people of great doubt. We see that right here with Elijah. You want to know someone else we can think of in the Scriptures who had great faith? but also was a person of great doubt. Remember John the Baptist? Hey, go, go ask him, is he really the one we are searching after when he is in prison? And people of great faith can also be people of great doubt. The man here who called down fire from heaven, killed 450 prophets of Baal, was afraid of his life because of one woman. Now I know women are pretty powerful and uh, sometimes scary, but anyways, we'll just leave that there. I'm, I'm, just, I'm just teasing, Caroline. But the point of it is, at times, we'll be spiritually strong, and at other times, we will be spiritually weak, no matter how great of a Christian you are. Number two, when Elijah felt most helpless, God was very close. You see, when he was there, and uh, he went to sleep, the angel of the Lord came, woke him up, gave him some food, let him go back to sleep. Told him to get up. He goes 40 days toward, before night and goes, gets to Horeb. And then we see the world when all these things happening, a still small voice. When Elijah felt the most hopeless, God was right there with him. And Christian, tonight, at times of hopelessness in our lives, what you got to understand is this. God is right there. This is the problem that we have a lot of times. In our lives, we get to a situation where like, I just don't know where God is. He's right there.
there with you. He will never leave you. He'll never forsake you. He's right there. God was with Elijah the entire time he was on the run from Jezebel. When Elijah felt most hopeless, God was very close. Number three, just because we feel something is true doesn't mean it is true. Elijah believed that he was the only one trying to serve the Lord. And God said there at the end of the chapter, there were still 7,000 that hadn't bowed to me. Number four, great discouragement will sometimes come after great victory. We've got to be so careful. I don't know, we get our guard down. I don't know what exactly happens. Great discouragement will sometimes come after great victory. And not always, sometimes. Which leads us to number five. God's not done with us even when we are done with us. God's not done with us even when we are done with us. And you know what I'm talking about. Ever been done with yourself? I've been there, okay? Maybe you haven't, but I've been there. Look at chapter 19 and look at verse number 15. What did the Lord tell him? And the Lord said to him, Go return on thy way to the wilderness of Damascus. God had something for him still to do. And you know, Elijah said, oh, I'm out here under this unit. Just, I'd rather just die. God, just take my life from me. And God says, Elijah, I'm not done with you. And just because Elijah was done, God still had a plan. God still had a purpose, and God had something for Elijah to do. And one of the things that I feel with Elijah, and I, I've studied him quite a bit, and I'm still doing a lot more studying on Elijah. But one of the things that you see is God took God just helped him. I think one of the things that, if you read about everything that Elijah said, I think he felt very lonely. And that's when God gave him Elisha. God helped him and gave him what he needed. And that's how God is. And so take the things tonight. I'm not an expert in all these things. I don't have all the answers. But I'll tell you this, this book does have the answers. And wow, children of Israel go from such a great place. The reign of David, the reign of Solomon, God doing great things. It's where everything is destroyed. And the problem was they didn't hearken to the voice of God and obey God. May we follow the Lord and do as He leads and follow Him. Father, we love You. We thank You for this evening. Thank You for Your love for us. Bless the rest of this that we do. Help us live for You this week. Pray you bless our service on Saturday, that many people would come and many would trust you as their Savior. We love you. Bless the rest of our night and bless this week. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. You're dismissed. Aren't you glad we didn't watch a nine-minute video on top of that?